Father, I just want to thank you for this day, and I want to thank you for this time. And Lord, I want to thank you for all the ways in which you do use us. Lord, I know there's so many in this body that are faithful witnesses for you, Lord, to go and speak to others about you, that share the good news, Lord, of your salvation. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen each of us to be those that would talk about you as we go along our way. And Lord, I pray you would open more opportunities for that, Lord, that we would meet the curious, we would meet the hungry, we would meet those that would want to know, that would want to listen. And Lord, I know for many of us that starts in our own families or with our own neighbors. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us that boldness and then you would match that boldness with open doors and ears that want to hear. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, just with a welcoming spirit within us, welcoming you, Lord, in our midst. And we welcome you, Lord, by opening your word and asking you to speak to us this morning, that you would continue to build us up, Lord, into the warriors of faith that I believe you want us to be. Lord, that you would dress us out in that armor that you allowed the Apostle Paul to describe to us, that you would grant us that wisdom, Lord, that was just spoken about earlier as we navigate these days. And Lord, let us never forget to whom we belong. Let no one take anything from us, Lord, that you've given. Let us always have you before our eyes as our God and our King. So Lord, we turn this time over to you and we continue now in a heart of worship, a prayerful heart, Lord, as we open your word. And we just simply ask that you would teach us, Lord, as we sit at your feet. And we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you can open with me to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. The first verse pretty much tells us where we're at in this story. If you remember, as we left the last chapter, we were in Athens. Paul speaking to the men of wisdom and intellectual crowd about Jesus, who he borrowed the term from them in their own idols, the unknown God, it was putting the true God in that place, trying to explain to them. Some of them listened, some of them scoffed at him, they mocked him for his teachings on Jesus and the resurrection. And so now in verse 1, we says, after those things, the things that I just spoke about, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Now, Corinth is a big part of our New Testament teachings. We have 1 Corinthians, we have 2 Corinthians to whom Paul wrote those letters. We know they were challenging churches, or it was a challenging church in Corinth, but yet so much happened under Paul's tutelage. And as much difficulty as he had with that church in Corinth, I love reading those letters because as much as he's struggling with them and their understanding and their sin, he's also excited because of their response to the gospel message and the truth about Jesus. Now, it's interesting as Paul comes into Corinth, that at that time, it was already an ancient city, even in Paul's day. And it was a commercial center. It had two harbors, and it all had been for a long time a rival of Athens. And Athens was their northern neighbor. Now, Corinth, if you remember from First and Second Corinthians and the teachings there, um, they had a reputation. And they had a reputation for loose living, especially sexual immorality. And it's interesting because in the classical Greece, Greek, not Greece, in the classical Greek, the comment to act like a Corinthian meant to practice fornication. So that really kind of speaks of their reputation. As a matter of fact, the title Corinthian Companion spoke of a prostitute. So that was the flag that they flew. And sexual immorality was encouraged because they worshipped Aphrodite also known as Venus, 
which was the goddess of fertility and sexuality. And we know from history that in 146 BC, Corinth was destroyed when they rose up and rebelled against Rome. And then that city laid in ruins for an entire century until Julius Caesar rebuilt the city. And then it quickly reestablished its former position as a center for both trade and immorality. One ancient writer described Corinth as a town where none but the tough survived. Now, because it was a trade center, people from all over the empire traveled through Corinth. So Paul knew that if he planted a church there, a strong church, it would touch lives from all over the empire. And even though it was a tough city, we see in Paul's actions that he wasn't really interested in planting churches where things weren't challenging, where things were easy. So let's read verse 1 again with a couple more verses in context. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And so here at Corinth, Paul formed this friendship with this couple named Aquila, actually Aquila, and Priscilla, which would continue throughout his entire life. Now we read here that Aquila was a Jew from Pontus, which was the northeastern province of Asia Minor. And he and his wife had been living in Rome, but they'd been driven out because of this anti-Semitic decree of Claudius Caesar, putting all the Jews out of the city. And since Corinth was located on the main route from Rome to the east, they stopped here and set up shop as tent makers. Tent makers, they did make tents, but they were also in general just leather workers. And Paul was also a tent maker by trade. Now, we can't know for sure, it's not clear from our text whether Aquila and Priscilla were already Christians when Paul met them, or whether they were saved through his ministry. But I believe the burden of evidence is on the side of them being believers when they came to Corinth. Um, But again, that's my belief, and maybe it was short order that as soon as they met Paul, that took place. Pick up with me in verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. So Paul reasoned in the synagogue. We know that was his habit, even though earlier he said he was moving on to the Gentiles. He could not really get over that habit to go to the Jews first. There he would persuade the Jews and the Gentiles that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. Now, you should recall, as we've come along, that Paul had left Silas and Timothy in Berea when he moved to Athens. And from there, he sent word for them to join him, and now they finally catch up with him in Corinth. And we read that after their arrival, it says that Paul was compelled by the Spirit. And this may mean that a burden was upon him to preach the message with great diligence, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is Messiah. Or maybe it means that he left his trade of tent making and leather work and gave all of his time to just preaching. Look at verse 6. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, for now I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So once again, we see that the crowd there raises up against, not so much Paul, although he was the object of their scorn, but against the gospel message against the power of God's word going forth. And we see in this case Paul's reaction. It almost seems pretty quick that he shook off his garments. And in shaking off his garments, he was sending the message that I'm done with you. I'm taking nothing of you with me. And I think he's getting quicker to recognize where he's wanted and where he's not. And he warns them, your blood be upon your heads. And he says, I am clean. 
And for now, I will go to the Gentiles, which was already established. But once again, he's learned his lesson with the Jews that would not listen. And I want to come back to his proclamation there. But let's see that God, as soon as this door was closed, opened another one literally next door. I think that's kind of humorous. So he opens a door right next door into this man named Justice House who was already a worshiper of God. And then this man Crispus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, which he had just literally been kicked out of, becomes a believer in all his household. And then it spreads out to the Corinthians. You know, I think that's a great lesson. People don't have to get saved in church. As a matter of fact, if we wait for people to get saved in church, there's a good chance they're going to end up dying and going to hell. People need to get saved as we meet them along the way. As a matter of fact, if you want to get somebody to come to church, invite them to your home first. Invite them to your home first and maybe a couple Christian friends and let them see that we're not the oddballs that they think we are or let them see that we are the oddballs that we think they are, they think we are, and that means we're just like them. And so oddly together, they may join us and come to church. But so many times we think that the first thing we need to do is get people to come to church. But let's get them to come to church and then the work will happen. Well, that's not necessarily true. And if that's your only method to get somebody to hear the word or to hear the truth or to get to know Jesus, then you're skipping a step. Because if you know them and you're talking to them, then do the business with them. And then if you can get them to go get to church with you, that's a bonus. But we're at a time now in this country for the first time that less than half the people in our country go to church. And the number is continuously decreasing. And when you have churches that have given it all up to the government and closed because of the pressure and the stress and the fear or whatever it is that has caused them to say, I won't do it anymore, it's only going to get worse. And so we need to take the church to the streets because you are the church. Now, I believe, going back to verse 6, that what we see here is the example of Paul understanding from the teaching of the Old Testament what it is to be a watchman. And in this case, he's being a watchman for the gospel. And we know from Ezekiel in chapters 33 where it speaks about the duties of a watchman, that the watchman would sit upon the rampart, and what they see, they must report. And if they don't report what they see, and the people are harmed, then the blood is upon the watchman's head for not reporting it. But if the watchman reports what he sees, and the people neglect to do what they need to do or respond to the report, then the blood is upon their heads. Matter of fact, from that chapter of Ezekiel, it says, whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take the warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. Why? Because it goes on, he heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes the warning will save his life. And so there are voices that are warning. There are voices that are warning about where we're at and what's coming. And I just hope you're listening. I hope you're listening, and I hope you respond. Now, I want us to consider something here before we move much further. I want you to consider how rudimentary, how common, and how seemingly benign the things were that Paul battled with compared to the challenges that we have in this day. I mean, these people that he was amongst, they had loose living. They had sexual immorality. They had idol worship. I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to water down those things. But my gosh, I almost want to say, Paul, is that it? I mean, consider, Paul was only beginning the work of the church then. He didn't have the now centuries of an established Christian foundation that we stand upon. I mean, Paul lived and ministered thousands of years after the world had been judged to be so evil that God was compelled by his own repentant heart to destroy all life on earth but with a flood. All life, with the exception of one family, that if you read in the Hebrew, we find that it had not been genetically corrupted 
by the life-altering evil of their time. And yet, we, the church, find ourselves today in the ever-growing shadows of the return of the days of Noah and its evil. I mean, the evil today is growing exponentially. And all life is, again, is being genetically reshaped into an image designed by man's twisted science with the help of fallen angel technology. It's the same thing that happened before the flood. It's the same thing that will lead to the judgment of Revelation, not by flood this time, but by fire. So my question is this to you and to anybody that might be listening and to any church that might capture this message, why are God's people silent? When Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? That's not my question. That's the question that Jesus himself asked about us. What does the church fear? I read this amazing quote. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. So my question is this, and I've been wrestling with this now for a solid week. And maybe this is just my conviction. And maybe a couple of you will share it. The question I've been wrestling with is this, have we made an idol out of despair? I think we stand in this strange place of trying to strike a balance as believers. I know how the story goes, so I'm not to be surprised by what I witness and what is coming. But at the same time, I am one as a Christian, and you are too, that is supposed to be anchored in hope. And so have I just decided for God where he is in the timeline of history? and just said, this will never change? Am I to just go along to get along because God's probably about to bring down that big hammer and get us out of here anyway? Or am I to actually have hope that this could turn around? And that hurts my mind because I'm so bent on it not turning around that I'm not sure I'm allowed to think that it might. But what do I do to myself? How much do I limit God? How much do I put him in a box saying, well, this is over. This country's done for. But how do I not become so hopeful that I become neglectful of preparing for what I think is coming? These are tough questions. These are tough things that we need to wrestle with. This is the exact reason that we need to go before the throne of God and ask him to pour his wisdom and discernment into our lives. Because I just proved to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have no idea what God's doing. Not really. Because I don't know his timeline. I see hints of what I know is coming. I smell in the air the beginnings of things that I can read about and know what they're going to look like, but I don't know how close we are to those things. And neither do you. So we need to be open to all possibilities. We need to be those that are actually walking in the spirit moment by moment, asking him to show us. We won't do that if we fear the world. We won't do that if we fear man. We won't do that unless we fear God. And I want to read that quote one more time. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Now listen as we go on to what the Lord spoke to a fearful apostle named Paul. Verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. 
For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, from the Lord's words to Paul, I believe we can safely assume that Paul was fearful. And the Lord offered Paul the antidote to his fear. And I believe the antidote to our fear. And that is this, speak and do not keep silent. In other words, do the very thing that you're afraid of. And what's the assurance of success in being obedient to this exhortation? It's that Jesus said these words, just four simple words. He said, I am with you. Nobody else can claim that but a believer. I mean, God is with the world, but he is nowhere close to anybody that is a non-believer as he is with a believer. God is with us. Emmanuel. It's funny how we only think about that at Christmas. Emmanuel. God with us. And we're heading into times where that very thing is going to be the subject of destruction. You may think it's rhetoric or maybe that I'm overstating the situation that we're in. Maybe because you haven't seen what you thought you would see if this country ever suffered a communist takeover. We're in the midst of a communist takeover. And you have to believe that. And I'll tell you why you have to believe that, because it's true. And communism cannot exist with God. Because you must worship the state where communism flourishes. This country is being given over to that. And it didn't just happen since January. It didn't just happen since November. There have been enemies to the system that we have in this country as a democratic republic Since the very beginning, there are enemies in this country in 1776 that did not want this to happen, and they have sought to destroy it from the very beginning. And it has been systematically and is being systematically turned over to those forces in a rapid fashion. In the meanwhile, we're being literally engineered as I've called them recently, by the new priest class, by the doctors and scientists that want to take ownership of you and I bodily. The engineer of food. Everything that we touch in this life is being controlled. Everything that's failing in the economy is being done on purpose. Don't look back and try to find a reason 14 months ago that it all ended up like this. Everything that started 14 months ago was just another tool in their toolbox to get us where we are at today. And the church needs to wake up. And you may say, Glenn, didn't you just talk about having hope? I did. And every life we study in the Bible was a man or in the woman in the middle of a crisis. And that's where their hope came alive. And so I'm not telling you to have hope such that the crisis is going to end. I'm saying have hope in the midst of the crisis because that's where Jesus is, with you and with I. Isaiah, Isaiah recorded these words in his 41st chapter Verse 10, he said, fear not, recording the words of God. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The hope isn't that this life is going to get brighter, easier, more happy. 
the hope is that no matter what happens in this life, we can be bright and happy in the midst of it if we fear our God and we don't let the works of man overcome us. We have to take a stand. You know, when you look at the founding of this country and you look at the brilliance of those that wrote in those days, the ones who directed what we have and what we're losing, it was very clear that there was a delineation between three things. There was the family, there was the church, and there was the state. You each have families. That's yours to deal with under the power of God. This is the church, and it's not run by the state. And we're going to maintain that. We're going to maintain that at a cost. I promise you. Do you know that the latest decree that since a couple days ago that we as a church, by decree, that we were supposed to develop a written policy such that someone would be standing at that door asking you if you'd accepted the state's inoculation. We're not doing that. It's none of my business. It's none of your business. We're under the sovereignty of God here, not the state. Jesus said to Paul, because I am with you, no one will attack or hurt you. We can claim that promise today. And further assurance was given in the Lord's confirmation that Paul was not alone when facing the people of Corinth. He said to him, the Lord, had, the Lord has people there. I think that's an interesting statement. I don't know if I can define that exactly. What does that mean that Jesus told Paul, I have people there? Does that mean he already had believers there? That's possible. Did he have those there that were going to become believers? Well, we see that as evidenced. But he has people there, meaning I have people that I'm going to use to support you in what you're doing, whether they're believers or not. Because he's the sovereign king. And his will and power are providential into the lives of all people, whether believers or not. Do you believe that God has people in this city for us? Yes. God will orchestrate our steps if we step out in confidence and faith to do what he's called us to do. He has people in this city, and not only people. He has warring angels. Warring angels. And sometimes I think we don't even address that in our thinking. I mean, there's a danger when you get into angels because people can slip into angel worship or making much more of it, not even much more of it, just thinking about it in strange ways. But the Bible is replete with stories of the angels fighting for those that follow the God of heaven. And so there's no reason we shouldn't believe that's true. And I wonder if we just don't entertain that or we, attain, or we entertain it unawares that those angels are working for us, that they're there to cover us, and they will war for us. Sometimes I think if we just step back in faith and believe that's going to take place. But my first pastor, Pastor Joey, he was a professional athlete before he got saved, and so he was part of that Christian's what is that? The Christian Athletics Group, whatever that's called. I can't think of it right now. So that athlete, was it? Athletes and actors, something like that. But he, because he had that, he got into places that other believers couldn't. And so we were in Virginia Beach, Virginia at the time, and he could get into high schools, talk to the students, and he did not hide his faith. 1984, he was the number one surfer, surfer in the world. And he talked, I remember him telling the story on a Sunday morning. He had been at a high school there in Virginia Beach that week. And he watched the entire student body and faculty literally transform before his eyes 
into a mob. The kids started to jeer what he was saying. He said the, te- the look on the teacher's faces changed. He said just evil set into that room, and they were against him and what he was saying. And I always remember that because he said he stepped back from that podium and he said, do you understand that I am surrounded by angels? And he said it in faith and that whole room changed. It went from ice cold to warm, faces went to relaxed and friendly and everybody started to listen. The man. First I thought, that's bold. (laughs) That's bold. And it wasn't like he was some big physical presence. Him and I were about the same, I was about the same, same height, same lack of height. We have power from heaven. The world doesn't have that. And we need to learn to exercise it, to walk in it. Our voices need to become stronger. Our faith needs to become stronger. Our willingness, our boldness to speak and to go where we have to go needs to grow. Verse 12, when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be the judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So it was probably toward the end of Paul's stay in Corinth that Galileo was appointed proconsul of Achaia. History-wise, it's about A.D. 51. And thinking the new proconsul would be friendly to them, the Jews brought Paul before him at the judgment seat in the marketplace there in Corinth. And the accusation that they leveled was Paul was persuading them to worship God contrary to the Jewish law. Before the apostle had an opportunity to testify, Galileo dismissed the matter with utter contempt. And he told the Jews this was strictly a matter of their own law and not one that came under his jurisdiction. I mean, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, then it would be reasonable for Galileo to bear patiently with the Jews. But actually, it was only a question of words and names in the Jewish law. And the proconsul had no intention of becoming a judge of such matters, so he dismissed the case. And I believe right there was an example of the Lord's reassurance to Paul that he had people in this city. I think it's also this an encouragement to keep church business in the church. I think that's been a mistake over the years. Like so many things the church should have been responsible for in the society and the culture, we've given it over to secular forces, or maybe we've given it over to the other spirit. But there's so much of the business of the church is to stay in the church and not given to civil authorities, and we've lost so much of that. And if the civil authorities were wise, they would just say, you know what, take that back to your church. But they won't. Too much money involved. Verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. So here again, we see the Lord's assurance of Paul's safety and that he was able to remain at Corinth even a while after that situation. And unlike previous cities, Paul wasn't forced out of Corinth. And we read that Paul decided to head back east to Jerusalem and then to Antioch. And now we know that he had this deep friendship by this time and a partnership with Priscilla and Aquila, so they decided to go with him. And we're told here that he had his hair cut off at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. So almost, un, almost certainly it was a vow of the Nazarite. And you can read about that in number six. We've talked about it before. I'm not going to go through all of that. But usually this vow was taken for a certain period of time. And when completed, the hair, which had been allowed to freely grow all that time, was cut off. And the hair was then offered to the Lord at a special ceremony at the temple in Jerusalem. 
Look at verse 19. And he came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Now recall, Paul wanted to preach in Ephesus two years earlier. We read about that back in chapter 16, but he was prevented, if you remember, by the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit gave him the freedom to preach in what was really an important city. And he had great results there. And this really reminds us that God has a special timing for everything in our lives. If Paul could have discerned it at the time, what the Holy Spirit was really saying was wait. Wait when he asked to go to Ephesus. It wasn't so much no. It was just wait. Now we see that Aquila and Priscilla stayed in Ephesus, seemingly at Paul's request, because something good started there. And Paul wanted that work to continue underneath the work of his trusted friends. Look at verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now it says that Paul had gone up and greeted the church. It means also that he went to Jerusalem and fulfilled that Nazarite vow in the temple. And then leaving Jerusalem, Paul returns to his home church in Syria, Antioch. And now I imagine they were pleased to have seen Paul return, tell of the work of the last three years. What a report. And what we come to now is the end of his second missionary journey. Look at verse 23. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So we don't know exactly how much time Paul spent back at his home congregation in Syria, Antioch. Luke wrote the account to give the sense of an immediate move on the Paul's next missionary journey. And Paul's first focus on the trip, which I always think speaks of his heart, was going and strengthening all the disciples. He went back to the churches already founded in the previous missionary works. Look at verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So now the story shifts back to Ephesus, where we left Aquila and Priscilla. And we find this eloquent preacher named Apollos. He arrives there, and they say that he's one that was mighty in the Old Testament scriptures. He was a Jew by birth, and he came from Alexandria, the capital of northern Egypt, which means he was probably also very well educated coming from Alexandria. His preaching was accompanied, we're told, by much power. He was very zealous. Yet somehow he was deficient in the knowledge of the Christian faith. Apparently, he'd only been schooled in the teachings of John the Baptist, the ministry of John the Baptist. He knew how John had called the nation of Israel repentance in preparation for the coming Messiah. Apparently, he didn't know about Christian baptism or some other matters of Christian doctrine. So when Aquila and Priscilla heard him speak in the synagogue, they recognized that he needed further instruction. So they lovingly took him aside and they began to teach him the deeper ways of God so he could be more accurate. And to his credit, as an educated, eloquent teacher of Scripture, he was willing to open his heart and receive the instruction. A good example for all of us. Verse 27, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So as a result of his teachable spirit, the brethren in Ephesus encouraged him in his desires to go to Corinth in order to preach. They wrote him a letter of commendation. And as a result, he was a great help to the believers in Corinth. 
He vigorously refuted the Jews who were public, the public, publicly showing that Jesus is indeed the Messiah of God. We're going to go just a few verses into the next chapter. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. So Paul now comes back to Ephesus. Now, in the previous chapter, we saw that he promised that he would return to Ephesus, and now he does. He made his way back to Corinth during his second missionary journey, and we're told that he came to Ephesus this time from the east, from the region of Phrygia. Now, a couple times in the last few weeks, I thought to myself, I should probably put a bunch of maps up here and start showing you where all these travels are going. If you have a study Bible, which you should, those maps are in the back of it. If you don't, the internet's full of them, so here's my admonition, do your homework. You guys need to go research that. If you want to know, well, where is all these places? Do your homework. Go look up those maps and look at where these travels have gone so you can picture it. It's not a, it seems like a great distance, and it was to them because it wasn't like jumping on a plane or jumping in the vehicle. But do that homework. Look for those maps and understand what these travels look like. So upon his arrival there, Paul encounters some disciples, we're told. And there's a great debate about these disciples. I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to teach it the way I see it. But there's a big debate. Were they believers? Weren't they believers? And I'm not going to get into that mess. I think the word's pretty clear. But it seemed there was something about these disciples that prompted Paul to ask them a question. And the question he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, we don't have any indication that it was Paul's custom to ask people if they'd received the Holy Spirit when they believed. I have to assume there was something Paul perceived that prompted the question about these guys. And the reply by these Ephesians revealed a vagueness and an uncertainty in their faith. It says they didn't know the Holy Spirit had been given. Now, remember, these were disciples of John the baptizer. And therefore, they were aware that the Holy Spirit existed. They'd been taught that the Holy Spirit would one day baptize God's people. But by their reply, these Ephesian disciples showed they didn't know much about God's nature as revealed in Messiah, in Jesus. They knew enough to be saved and to be students of Jesus, but they didn't know much about all Jesus did for them, especially his promise to send the Holy Spirit when he ascended to heaven. They didn't know that Jesus had died, had been buried, had risen from the dead, and ascended back to heaven. They didn't know that he had sent the Holy Spirit. So Paul explained all of this to them. He reminded them that when John baptized with baptism and repentance, he urged them to believe on Jesus as Messiah. We read there, when they heard this from Paul, they were then baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So with a repentant heart prepared in them by the preaching of John, the baptizer, the now fuller understanding by Paul's teaching, now they were rebaptized this time fully into Jesus. And then it says Paul laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now listen, this is the fourth distinct time in Acts when the Holy Spirit was given. The first was chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. 
and it involved Jews primarily. The second was in Acts chapter 8 when the Spirit was given to the Samaritans through laying on the hands of Peter and John. The third time was in Acts 10 at the household of the Gentile Cornelius in Joppa. Now the order of events leading up to the reception of the Holy Spirit is different in each case. But nonetheless, as faith came in Jesus Messiah, we know that there was immediate indwelling of the Spirit within them, and yet there was a baptism of that Spirit that seemed to be subsequent to that. And I've explained this to us many times, and I'll just briefly, without going into it too deep, we need to understand that there are three positions of the Holy Spirit that we interact with. The Holy Spirit, since the beginning of time, creation onward, has been with the world. That has always existed. We know that in the Old Testament times, that when a man was called or a woman was called to do something that required the power of God, the Holy Spirit would come upon that person for that task. The New Testament relationship is utterly different. Because of our faith in his grace, he comes to indwell us. So at the moment of faith, the moment we put our faith, we surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior, he comes and makes his life in us. He's always been with us, but now he lives in us. That's the New Testament relationship. But that other relationship of him coming upon us for power still exists like it did in Old Testament times. And we have the option of asking for that relationship just like we asked for the relationship of salvation. And it's sometimes confusing for people. Sometimes it's argued, is that not being true? And so these men were saved. They had the indwelling, but they really didn't even understand what happened to them because they understood their sin from John's preaching they repented of that sin, moved into a faith in the one that was coming, but don't even understand now, as Paul met them, that he had come and that he had promised the Holy Spirit would be given in a completely new way in that New Testament covenant where believers would interact with the Holy Spirit for power in their lives. And so that's what he's explained to them. And he puts hands on them and he prays and they receive that anointing, that baptism. And it happens individually. Like you say, well, wasn't that a group of people? Yes, it was. And yet, as I took you through the history of the givings of the Holy Spirit, we see it happen in different ways. And the Lord operates like that. Probably none of us have the exact same story of salvation. Every one of us has a conversion story that's a little bit different. Every one of us that's ever been touched by the Lord and healed probably has a different story of how that came about, although there's similarities. Every time you see Jesus heal in the New Testament, he does it differently. Why? Because Jesus died and was raised for all of us, but he comes to each of us in an incredibly personal way. Incredibly personal. And I want to encourage you in that this morning. If your relationship with Jesus has always been via a crowd, in other words, your relationship with Jesus has always been about either the family you grew up in or the church you attend, then I want to offer you this. There's more. There's more and there's something deeper because there is a personal relationship that he has for you. And if you've never felt that you've had that personal relationship, that your relationship has kind of been in the midst of the crowd, either your family or the church that you've attended, then I want to say to you, get excited. Because there is something else that he has to offer you, and he wants that direct and personal relationship with you. And he wants to begin that today. So be honest with yourself, whether you, whatever group you think you're in, and if you have to use the word group, then you're the one I'm talking to because it's about you. It's not about the group. There's power in the group. Churches are important. Families are important. The faith of all those groups are important. But right now, today, 
the thing the Lord wants to speak to you about is his relationship with you. And that includes the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And a couple questions I think that I want you to wrestle with as we begin to wrap things up. I want you to be able to answer this question. Has he come to you? Can you answer that personally? Has he come to you? Has he called your name? See, because he knows you individually. And when he comes for you, when he comes to you, he will call you specifically. And if you're thinking to yourself, I I don't know if I've ever had that, then I would say, then open your spiritual ears this morning because he's calling. And if he's called you, and he's called you personally, then the next question I have for you is, did you answer him? Can you honestly say this morning that you answered him? And if you didn't, will you answer him this morning? I I can't think of a lonelier thing than trying to navigate the rest of this life that we're in in 2021. I can't think of anything lonelier than trying to do it without God. And you may say, but I've known God all my life. Did you know him through the church? Did you know him through your family? Did you know him through another strong believer? Or do you know him? Do you know him? And if you did answer him, here's my other question. Did you go the distance with him? Have you gone the distance with him? Or did you stop at the conviction of sin? Did you stop at the need of a Savior, but you never fully enter into that new life, the life, that new life that he promises? And even if you did enter, and I'm going to ask the same question, have you gone all the way with him? Because you're still here, which means there's more that he has for you. Either you're not yet saved and you need to be, or you are saved and there's a whole lot more that he's calling for you to do and a whole lot more of himself that he wants to pour into your life. And if you're saved this morning, or you will be before you leave here, I hope, and you've never asked for that anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, then you're doing a whole lot in your life under your own power. Or maybe you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know what that baptism is like, but you're dry. You're dry because you forgot that the Scripture encourages you to keep continuously being refilled. We're conduits for that Spirit and that power. He pours it in our lives and out of our lives, and when we get to that point, we need to continuously be opening that conduit so that he can pour freshly into us. So then my question becomes, have you received the full baptism of his life in you and upon you? Do you live in the power of the resurrected Messiah by the workings of the Holy Spirit in your life or by your own power? I'm going to ask you, whoever I'm talking to right now, to be bold. And if any of those questions challenged you, and you think, you know, I I have not answered, or maybe I'm not sure I answered, or maybe I'm just not confident about that I've, I've actually taken the steps I should, or maybe you've just never had that anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, I'm just going to ask you to stand. Don't be embarrassed. The Lord's calling on a few others. Just stand. I just want to pray right now before we go into our communion time for those that have taken a stand and for those couple of you that have not stood that should. Father, again, we just acknowledge your presence in this room. 
and we acknowledge your presence in our lives, Lord. And Lord, I, I want to pray for these brothers and sisters that have been bold enough to stand and admit, Lord, that there's more of you for them. And Lord, there can be no shame in that. Lord, I pray that every one of us would stand right now and say, Lord, I want more of you. I want that power, Lord. I want that anointing. And Lord, I'm praying right now, by extension of your hands and your power and your all-seeking eyes, Lord, upon these, Lord, who are calling upon you today, Lord, to settle your spirit upon their lives, to fill them up to overflowing, to anoint them with power for the days that we have ahead. And with that power, Lord, I pray that there would be discernment and there would be wisdom and there would be a fresh understanding, Lord, of your love and your grace and your mercies. And Lord, that we would walk out of this place this morning, not only saved, but changed and refreshed and made bold in a way we never had. And we're going to realize that no man has power over us and that you are the sovereign king and Lord and creator of all. And so, Lord, I pray that anointing on my brothers and sisters, that it would fall upon them, that it would fall upon this room, that it would touch each of us, Lord. And, Lord, if any of us are already filled up, Lord, then just break that dam and let that living water flow through us. Lord, do a miraculous work in us because you are a miraculous God. And, Lord, you are not done with us. And, Lord, we stand in solidarity with your spirit, and we declare today, Lord, we will not fear. We will fear you that no other fear overcomes us. We lift your name on high today, Lord. We speak the name of Jesus over our lives, over this church, over our families and our city. And we will listen to no other voice. And I ask that and I pray that, I proclaim that. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Now we're going to move into our time of communion. And I want you to realize that everything that the Lord just spoke about that is possible for you and I as believers, everything that he has given to us as promise, everything that he has talked to us about in this life that is power, all of that was made possible but why, but by what we're going to celebrate here in a moment. Because he came to die. He came and he died and he rose again on the third day because he said he would. And at that point, he reset all of time that we would have a way to be reconciled with the Father again because we were dead in our sin and trespasses prior to that possibility. And I pray that every one of you has made that decision, if not prior to today, then in the moments before you leave this building, that you lay it all down and you realize this world has nothing for you in comparison to what we're waiting for. And again, I hope you can join with me in heart and say those words and say them with conviction. I will fear God, but I will fear no man. So, Father, again, we just come to you, Lord. We bow our knee and our hearts before your throne. Lord, I feel like we've come to that line in the sand, Lord. That line in the sand where we say we will, we will go the distance with you, but we will let nothing that is not of you come across that line into our lives. And so, Lord, as we come to this communion table, just let us find a heart of peace. And, Lord, just celebrate in love, Lord, of what you did for us. Because nothing we speak about, nothing in your word, nothing that you've proclaimed, nothing that's true and right would have ever been possible unless you did this work. And I don't know how to thank you for that, Lord. But I join my brothers and sisters today with the only language we have. And we praise you. We give you honor and glory. We say thank you. We say we love you. And we say the name of Jesus. 
Amen.